So you were on probation, drinking and driving, selling drugs, and carrying a gun. Do you think you have a problem with alcohol? To be honest, no. Okay. Oh. So do you think it's just bad luck that you've been arrested for all these driving under the influence? I would say I would do it at the wrong time. I wouldn't say it was bad luck. I say I would do, do it at the wrong time. What, what do you mean by that? By like drinking and driving and on certain type of days. And We're about to watch the parole hearing of a man who really can't seem to stay out of trouble, yet he continues to get a slap on the wrist after slap on the wrist. He's serving a maximum of 30 months for his recent offenses. His full term date would be June 21st, 2025 if he is not paroled. Let's jump in and listen to this hearing. Serving a sentence of five years, execution suspended after 30 months jail with three years probation to follow for criminal possession of a firearm defense weapon, illegal operating a motor vehicle under the influence, a VOP of illegal possession of weapon in a motor vehicle, possession with intent to sell, dispense hallucinogens, and illegal operation of a motor vehicle under influence, alcohol or drugs. As of today, a record reflects a parole eligibility date of 3-20-2024 at 50%. There's no victim info in this case. The offender has an offender accountability plan. Review of the plan shows the offender has completed voices. He's currently working as an outside clearance worker and he remains on the wait list for addiction services. Utilizes the statewide collaborative offender risk evaluation system scores the offender overall score for recidivate goes within the high range. Mr. Miller, this is your opportunity to express to the board why you believe you should be granted parole. Mary Jim. Um, I feel like I should be granted parole because I think I had like a good enough disciplinary to the point where I have changed. I want to change my life around. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I did was wrong. And because of that, I, I now have I now have two kids now, so I want to change my life around for them. And I also have to help my my girlfriend because she she's in need of help. So, All right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you can you can go. No, no, no. I thought you were done. Keep talking. That's fine. OK, OK, OK. So. Doing voices. It taught me that I could have really hurt myself and I could also like hurt other people. So thinking of that, I want to say sorry for breaking the law. And that's it. OK, thank you, Mr. Miller, for your statement. We have questions for you. When we're done with our questions, we'll deliberate and give you our decision. OK, yes, ma'am. We'll begin with my colleague, Ms. Paul Mary. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You. So, Mr. Miller, these are some very concerning charges. You got multiple driving under the influences. One of the cases you were, the car was in drive and you were intoxicated in the back seat of the car. In the back seat. Yeah, or sleeping in the car. Yeah, sleeping in the car, yeah. 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 Okay. And, um, Did you, is your license, was your license va um, valid or was it still under suspension from the driving under the influences? I think it was still under the suspension because I haven't paid the, the fee, but I think it was up though, so it was still under. Okay, and were you supposed to have an interlock system in your car? Um, they just had sent me that like after, after the fact. Okay, okay. So you said you, you know what you did was wrong. What did you do that was wrong? What did I do that was wrong? I was driving drunk. I had a, a legal weapon in the car and I had legal drugs. Okay. Why did well let's well, let's start with why were you selling drugs and why did you have a gun? I had a gun because I had I had a recently friend that had passed and I was just scared of my life. I was trying to protect my family. 
So I was just keeping it for defense. And I was selling drugs because I had I had no I had no job. And I was trying to make money for my family. Why why weren't you working? I wasn't working because I was still in this case and nobody wanted to hire me at the, at the point because I was still like under investigation and stuff. So when you applied for jobs, they knew you were under investigation so they wouldn't hire you? Yes. Okay. I, I don't know how they would know that unless you told them. They had looked in, they looked at my background. Okay, well that makes a little bit more sense. They looked at your criminal history. Correct. Okay. All right. Have you done drug treatment before? Yes. Where have you done it? I have done it at AIC. And um I did um addiction services here. Um you did I think it, it was 2017. Okay. Was that one of the tier programs? I think so. Okay. I had or a DUI had, program? Uh, he, I think it was a DUI program, but it was addiction services, though. Okay. So you were on probation, drinking and driving, selling drugs, and carrying a gun. Right. Okay. So my question to you is, why wouldn't you talk to probation about helping you with employment? And why were you not going to drug treatment or alcohol treatment? Um, I wasn't. I wasn't supposed to do a drug treatment. Well, were you supposed to be doing something for your DUIs, going to any kind of programming, not drinking? I don't. I don't think so. Not that I know of. Okay. So what was what was probation having you do then? I was almost done with my own probation, actually. Did you hear Ms. Page? Say that again. You completed 242 days of your probation, and it was a three-year term. That's not almost done. So that leaves you, not even that leaves you almost two years left. Oh, when I had went, when I had went to my last, um, my last when they told me to come in. That's what I that's when they told me I was almost done. OK, all right, so let's move forward. So you haven't since you've been incarcerated, you've done the voices program and you have a job at the outs doing outside clearance maintenance work. Yes, you have outside clearance doing maintenance work. OK, how long you've been doing that? I've been I started May 1st of last year. OK, all right. And you're still waiting to do addiction services? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what, what um, do you think would be the benefit of doing a program like that? It would help me, to be honest, I think being in here this amount of time, it has re rehab, rehabbed me. And I think that class will help me a little bit, but to be honest, I, I know where my head is and I don't want to do anything dumb. What would be dumb? Like drink or drive, like any probably not have, even probably not even drink. Probably not even drink. Do you think you have a problem with alcohol? To be honest, no. Okay. Oh. So do you think it's just bad luck that you've been arrested for all these driving under the influence? I would say I would do it at the wrong time. I wouldn't say it was bad luck. I'd say I would do, do it at the wrong time. What, what do you mean by that? By like drinking and driving and on certain type of days and just driving and, and drinking. Period. Period. Right? You're drinking. You sh you're you're pro You should not be driving. Right. See, when I read all the information about your uh, 
your drug history, your alcohol history, primarily. You know, I see somebody that struggles with alcohol. You drink excessively, you drink where you are sleeping in a car, you get behind a wheel. So for me, I, I'm I'm seeing somebody that needs some more something to help him appreciate I would say the that. benefits of being sober. Why why he should be sober and why alcohol is a problem. I would say that. Okay. Uh, you told the parole officer you've been sober since February 2023? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, when you are back out in the community, you have three years of probation, what do you think you need to be doing? Looking, well, I have a job lined up for myself if, if I am to be released soon in the Hartford Hospital, so that will help me out. Okay, and you you mentioned to the parole officer that you would like to release to your girlfriend's house? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And why is that a, a supportive environment for you? That's a supportive environment for me because now I have, I have a newborn that I haven't even touched yet and it's killing me that I haven't even touched him yet and I do not want to mess that up and I also have a seven-year-old daughter that misses me a lot what are you what are your other than employment you're living with your girlfriend what else is your plan for being in the community my my other plans are to get my license restored and I'm trying to also look forward to doing CDL if that's possible for me well, that might be a little bit of a challenge with your your driving record, but down the road, you never know. It's a go good long term goal. All right. So you graduated from high school in 2013. That was 14 years ago, roughly. What have you been doing in that 14 years? Um, I have been dipping, dipping and dodging out of jobs. Um. I would say I got two kids now. Um, Let me ask you a quick question. Why do you think it's it's difficult for you to keep a job? I mean, at one point would, you were working for UPS. That seems yeah. to me that would be a good job, especially yeah, for somebody job. with children, a family to support. So, right. so what do you think the struggle is with keeping a job? Um. I would say back then I was a little lazy. So, and some of the and UPS job I had, it was a supervisor that, that didn't like me. So I had came in from sick and I didn't I didn't call, and I could have I could have got that job back, but I didn't call the union. You know, I, well, you're 30 now, so I I'm hoping that you can appreciate that. You know, sometimes it's you just have to, you know, keep quiet and just move forward, right? So you can't like everybody you work with. You got to sort of make the best of situations sometimes, especially when you have a family to support, right. especially when you're on probation, on parole, mm -hmm. you know, and, and employment provides structure and stability. You, you seem to have struggled with that since 2016, at least. So, all right, Mr. Miller, thank you for answering my questions. You're welcome. Ms. Page? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Miller, some of the things that you shared with my colleague, I, I just cringed. Uh, you know, part of the reason it's looking at your record that you couldn't maintain employment is because your occupation may, be, may have been selling narcotics. Can you repeat that question? I, your occupation, your choice of occupation, instead of working like a, a, a legal job with selling yes. drugs to the in the community. And that, that was very relatively lucrative, right? You make a whole lot of money selling drugs rather than 
going to a nine to five, coming home with maybe five hundred dollars if you're lucky. You you're right about that, but being in here, it, it, it changed my whole life around. So I want to just change my ways, of how I act and how, how I see things. And not well, want to end up back in here. Well, we don't want you to end up back in there either. But, you know, you're your your own worst enemy, sir. When you said you wanted to obtain your CDL license, I was like, my heart dropped because I can. Can you imagine what would happen driving an 18 wheeler under the influence? Wouldn't be good. Exactly. It could be a catastrophe. It, 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 I mean, it's just, I, I just don't understand. And you're saying to us that, oh, no, I don't have a problem with alcohol. And, and you got caught at the wrong time. Is that what you said? You were caught at the wrong time or you were just, it was the wrong time. I think you meant drinking at the wrong time. Yeah. What's dr drinking. drinking at their driving? <laughs> oh, Drink. Yeah, because you had an empty bottle of Hennessy in the car, right? Correct. And you said you were coming from a party? No, I was uh, basically, yeah. So you were drinking at the party? You brought your own Hennessy to the party, or did you get the Hennessy after? I brought it to the party. And in your underlying offense, you are under the influence of alcohol and marijuana, right? Right. And um, why did you have a knife in your car? Was that the recent one or was that the one in 2016? 20... 2016. Oh, that I had a knife because I was doing some, I wasn't really using that as a weapon. That was just in my car because I was cutting something open. What were you cutting open that you had to leave it in the car? I, I was cutting. I was cutting like a bag or something that was hard to open, and I accidentally left it in my car. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even have the have the ball. Excuse my um language, but I wouldn't have the balls to um even cut anybody. Be honest with you. So if you, so why, then why would you have a gun? If you wouldn't hurt anybody with a knife, why would you have a gun? And, and then you say, to, to protect honest, your family. Go ahead, to be honest. Well, I had a situation that I had a couple of people that passed away and I hung around them. So I didn't want to get re retaliated on. And I live in Hartford, so that's why I had moved to East Hartford to get out of that situation. So you think the people in Hartford can't come to East Hartford? Say that again? You think the people that are in Hartford cannot come to East Hartford? Well, if, I don't let, if I don't let nobody know where I live, and a lot of people knew where I lived, It, it's your your mentality, Mr. Miller. You know, trouble. I don't think most people who are looking for trouble. Trouble can find you wherever you are. And, you know, the mentality of I had to have a gun to protect my family. Um, it is concerning to me because innocent people are losing their lives every single day behind with, with from, because of people like yourself who choose to carry these firearms without the proper training and the proper licensure you know bullets don't they don't discriminate anyone can, right. can fall victim to that and if you especially in the hands of a person who wants to drink alcohol smoke marijuana and carry a firearm recipe for disaster okay. you have to understand that it's bigger than just you operating a motor vehicle. It's it's the compilation of everything together. It's concerning. Okay. Okay. And your sentences are just going to get longer and longer because this is your second weapons charge. How many DUIs? Two or three. Two or three. 
be more than three. At least three. Yeah, it's got to be three. At least. Yeah. I don't know, Mr. Miller. This is a big ask. Um, I did see your evaluation from voices. It says you did very good. And you have outside clearance. Yes, and I also have a work report that I have forgot and on my button. There's a work report. He forgot it back in his phone. Oh. What does it say? It said I have been. It says excellent, and um, I have been doing all the the good standards at what I do when I'm outside, and I I I never missed a day. Well, yeah. You you remember what you said to my colleague about UPS? You didn't go to work. You you were sick, but you didn't call. Yes. Just imagine if I was sick and I didn't call my boss and say I wasn't going to be here today. And, and I, my, this is my job. I, I'm supposed to be here to talk to you. What do you think would happen with this hearing? Yeah, but you right. Like, but that situation I had, I called in sick one day and we get three days off. So that supervisor didn't know. Because he had just came back in. So when you come back in, I had came back in. He told me I was fired. Well, you that's and, not what you just said, though. What you just said was you didn't call. Now you're saying that you did call? I called, yeah, because the, the supervisor that was there already, mm -hmm. he knew. And then when he came back in, the next supervisor that came in, he came back in and didn't know that I, I called in sick. Because when you call in sick, it's three days that you have to not call. But and you then said when you, you come back, call. yes, I said I did call, and then I didn't call in. I was supposed to call in. So when I came oh, back oh, to work, to say that I'm coming yeah, back, yeah, to, to, to oh. come back, yes. Okay. So, yes. Okay. I understand now. Okay. And, All right. And I never and I never called the union, so I could have got that job back. To be honest with you. Well, you can't slander a job. You never. You're, you're never going to make the kind of money that you were making selling drugs by at you know by not showing up to work. You, you have to get your education. Go back to school. But you know. I mean, plan on that. Yeah, I hope so, because you're accumulating a history, Mr. Miller, at a very young age. All right, I'm all set, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Mr. Miller, what I see is a whole lot of immaturity, if I'm being quite honest with you. You know, dipping and dodging jobs, and and you'll regret that someday. I read in the paper, the, the UPS drivers, when you get up to a driver, position, they're making more than us, and they make a lot of money. That's a solid career with the Teamsters, so you're a union worker, like, you know, um, it's it's immaturity the the way you were you were behaving and um the weapons saying you know you were scared for your life and protecting your family what are you going to do with that gun you're going to kill somebody i ain't gonna kill nobody but um I'm gonna... but what but what somebody comes with a gun you're going to pull out the gun and one of you is going to die so how who are you protecting or you might get somebody killed by pulling out that gun because that you know, the person you're pulling it on might have their own gun and think they have to defend themselves. It just doesn't make sense. You're right. And you told our parole officer that one of your risks might be problems with people in the community. Who do you have problems with? Um, whoever had retaliated on my um, my boy, a couple of them. Right, but what does that have to do with you? I hang around them. Okay, and so don't I hang don't. around anymore. I mean, yeah, I you know, know that's why. Yeah, Look. you're you're well into adulthood now. You know, you can't act like a kid anymore. You're 30 years old, and you're a father. So Absolutely. you have to change your thinking, and you have to move forward, establish a career for yourself. Stop hanging out. Those days are over. You know, and that's I so would really rethink. Your idea that alcohol is not a problem, because according to my records, it is. And maybe you're in some kind of denial and you think you can control your alcohol use, but the average person does not go out for a few drinks and fall asleep driving their car, sir. That's a problem. 
So um, I'm done with my question. I think my colleagues covered it all. Give us some time to discuss your case. You can listen to our deliberation. We'll give you our decision, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Paul Mayor. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, Mr. Miller has done his, some good things in yeah. terms of the Voices program, as we've said, outside clearance isn't just given to anyone. Yeah. Um, he has no disciplinary reports, has a place to live. Um, my, I guess my primary, the charges are what they are. They're serious. We've gone through them. Um, the fact that this is probably his third DUI, plus he has a driving while under suspension. I mean, all that is public is a risk to the to public. Uh, and the fact that he doesn't acknowledge or recognize, maybe it's better, that he has a drug, an alcohol problem. Yeah. So I get my biggest concern is that he hasn't done an addiction services program, any kind of tier program. And being that he's 30 years old, I guess I want to be hopeful that he would gain some insight from it as opposed to have when he took it probably a couple of years ago. Um, so I would be I would be a deny for today, but I'd be willing to bring Mr. Miller back in six months and have him do a tier program. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Page. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have Mr. Miller denied as well. Um, I don't have him coming back. Uh, the fact that he uh, committed this offense while he was on probation um, and so, you know, um, the lack of the program, it just in discussing here today, just I don't know that very much has changed. And yeah. um, so I just I don't believe uh, that he is appropriate for discretionary poll at this time. I have similar concerns. I, you know, I, I, I just I don't hear the change that I hoped to hear um, in, in discussing this case with Mr. Miller. Uh, he really did present very poorly, and I don't know that he's learned anything from this incarceration. I have real concerns about him returning to the community, but he does have three years of probation supervision to follow, so I would not be in favor of a rehear either. Um, Readings for denial. Probation? Yes, definitely while on probation, uh, criminal history. Anything else? Look, be it into a tier. Inadequate program? All right. Oh boy, and evidence of the patient here. Same, yeah, we'll put those together. And then you want to we'll you know for the record that, that you were in favor of a reader. Yes, I will. In the matter of Rashad Miller, MA number 423545, I'll make a motion to deny parole for the following reasons. Um, inadequate program participation and evidence of offender change. Offense committed while on probation and criminal history. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. This All right, oh, I'm sorry. Sir, unfortunately we could not grant you parole, but we hope that you'll continue to work on yourself and take advantage of the probation that you have to follow because they can help you um, the same way that, that uh, parole can with programming and services. We want you to be successful and not come back here, sir. Thank you. So, so can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, so yes, I wouldn't be up to come back to parole or something no. denied. Right. I mean, you're you're done. I don't know what his estimated release is next yes, year. Uh, yeah, about about a year from now. Um, you can talk to your counselor about applying for halfway house. I don't know if your halfway house approved or not, but. Uh, I mean, yeah. He is, yeah. Okay. So you could you could possibly go out on uh, community release through the Department of Corrections. Talk to your counselor. Okay. Uh, this comes will be hearing from Mr. Miller, Rashad Miller, four five four five. We can get this in um, the mail. Okay, Mr. Miller, so you're all set. All right. Good luck to you. Thank you. Where's Mr. Mirabella when you need him, right? Now, I think I think that they did a decent job in the sense that they were disgusted and disturbed by how much he he's um, a risk 
to, to going back to the public and how he hasn't done anything to improve and how he um, is in denial about his, his drinking problems. But also, I think that what we see here is that it is a clear case of just kicking the ball down the road. I mean, he, 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 his full term date is June 21st, 2025. That's, that's in 14 months. And wouldn't it have been better to, like, you know, this is the time where I might actually say, you know, Steve Hoyle makes sense. Instead of just saying, well, why don't you just sit in prison and wait for your, you know, for your full term date? <laughs> we'll worry about it later. Why not send him to some type of long term substance abuse program? where he can graduate in nine months, hopefully learn something, hopefully, we don't know, but, and then as his carrot at the end of the, at the end of the tunnel, he gets, he gets out, you know, five months earlier, whatever the math is, you know, that's actually something that I think I can appreciate what Louisiana does in this, these type of specific situations, because simply letting him out, <laughs> what, do you, we expect a change you know the only thing that would be going is like basically the three is probation so what you have to do is hope that when he gets in the car and drinks that when he is caught that he doesn't not kill anyone and he is now caught and sent back to prison because of violating probation which he's already done in this case so there is no proof that he's not going to go and do it. he was on probation when he got locked up for this with everything on the line he still couldn't help himself but to get in the car with an empty bottle pass out in his car with all of the risk with prison Basing prison time, knowing all of that, that is the definition of having no control over your sobriety when you can't make decisions that are in your own clear best interest. And they're going to release him in the same scenario. That was one of the board members. It seemed that she wanted to make on a record that she was opposed. I think she wanted to have him to come back in six months for some type of program. And they said, no, I don't know what that program is and exactly what it what it. And I think they should have done that because it, 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 you know, whether the program actually has an effect or not, I get, I get it. This probably, but, but still is better than just kicking the ball down the road. I mean, he doesn't even have enough knowledge to know that at his own parole hearing to at least pretend to, that he knows he has a, a problem. That's how far away he is from not being a menace to society, a risk to society. He doesn't even know that he should fake it. So the DOC locked him up to protect him in, for a short term, but, they, they, the, but it has done nothing to protect society for the long term. And I, it just makes you wonder, what, what, like, why are there no mandatory programs? Why, why are they not, why is he not being, it's just crazy to me. Then, um, you know, you talk about, well, you know, for all the different arguments, people say, well, he has no, you know, he had no opportunity. What's he supposed to do? And it's like, no, that's not true. UP, he had a job with UPS. And I, you know, I, I went on to AI and, and, and uh, to look in and to just, I was curious and UPS, yeah, they have a whole felon program. It depends on, on what your felony was and, and when you had your felony. It, it, they don't get into the details on the website. Then I looked at the starting salaries. I was curious about that. It's not as high as I thought. It's like the median for a UPS driver in Connecticut is 39700 a year. Um, and then there are different, you know, not everyone's a driver, right? You could be a, um, a stock handler at 37000 You could be in shipping, receiving. Um, you know, there's different... But it is a union job, so you get all those health benefits, and then I bet the money because I, I I had always heard, and I think a lot of us have heard, how UPS pays well. So I bet it's in the overtime. You probably, you probably during the peak seasons can make like, you know, 
I don't know what the number is, but I'm sure you can make 50, you know, a, a large chunk of, of 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 maybe of your salary in the in the two or three months of the year to send overtime. That would be a guess. Um, we keep seeing people in Connecticut losing what seems to be good union jobs at UPS, and that's you know I really wonder what they're what, they don't share the numbers. I tried to find it, like what the success is of the program what the turnover rate is, what percentage stay. It's not a number they make public, right? Um, I think, you know what I want to do? I want to hear some Mr. Mirabella because I think, uh, I think that, that hearing some, this, what Mr. Mirabella would have said in this situation is uh would be quite will be quite a gem so so let's go let's go listen to a few just a, a little bit of mirabella well I'm, i mean what about the first dwi second dwi third dwi fourth dwi third fourth fifth sixth uh rev revocation you've had a number of opportunities and i bet you you felt the same way in each one of them i ain't going back again this is my last one and yet you get back out and you go back to drinking or doing drugs. So are you an alcoholic? No, sir. You're not? No, sir. You've been convicted of how many DWIs? Four. It's fair to say you probably were behind the wheel 40 times drinking and driving. You've been to prison for drinking and driving. You don't think you're an alcoholic? I've made very bad decisions while drinking. Drinking tends to change the person that I am. Well, let me tell you something. You go to AA? I intend to when I get home, yes, sir. Have you ever gone to AA? No, sir. You know, there's a saying in the AA, and that saying is, you know, I didn't get in trouble every time I was drinking, but every time I got in trouble, I was drinking. Yes, I, I agree with that. And you don't think you have an alcohol problem, that you're an alcoholic? Until you accept the fact that you have a drinking problem and you are an alcoholic, you're going to continue to do the same things. So tell me what your tools are that I can be comfortable saying, I'm going to vote to release you because I'm not worried about you going out and killing one of my friends or one of my family members because they happen to run into you on the streets when you're drinking and drunk and driving. So tell me what you're going to do that makes me comfortable to say, I'm willing to let you out. Now, that's kind of what I was looking for. And if you haven't seen this parole hearing, it was quite, quite incredible, again, to see it. This guy just did not identify as having a problem, even though he's sitting there, sitting in prison um, for, his, for, for his fourth D, DUI. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to this. If you're not familiar, there's a chance that you're not familiar that I have a second channel that covers Louisiana parole hearings, and it's very different, Louisiana and Connecticut. Man, the way they handle the hearings, the culture, it's just, it's night and day. Um, but I'll put I'll put a link to that here if you want to see this hearing. Um, it's, you know, you kind of don't know, you kind of don't, what's the saying with, uh, you don't know what you have until it's gone, and that's because Mr. Mirabella is no longer on, on the board, but we have plenty of hearings where, where he makes an appearance. And I know that in some cases he takes it overboard, like <laughs> pushing someone who maybe had a, was a drinking when he was 17, 38 years ago when he committed a crime, and Mr. Mirabella insisting that the guy <laughs> has, has a drinking problem, but neither here nor there. Anyways, this was an interesting hearing. Thank you, Richard, for the info. And also Carol, who had contributed when Richard was away with providing this information on this case. Um, I think the bottom line is, is that he's he's getting out no matter what in uh, June of 2025, and he's not going to have the tools. And that's scary. Um, you know, and it, it, one more thing is that we do see parole board members release 
uh, release child predators and release different type of uh, people into the community, um, usually with much more leniency. But I think when it comes to DUIs, they're much more cautious. And that's because the uh, a, DUI, a vehicular homicide, it, it traces straight, it always makes the paper. You can't hide that. You know, when a child is reharmed, people don't hear about it. It gets swept under the rug. But when someone is killed in a vehicular homicide, and then the press goes crazy, they say, how is it possible he's even on the road? And that's, I think, one reason, additional reason why we don't see parole board members, why they're extra cautious, because it's their reputation on the line. And I think that's saying something. But I'll leave on that note. And with that, I'll let you go. Mr. Bakke, can you hear me too? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, we're going to get started with your rescission hearing. Good morning. I am P.O. Mike's here, a hearing examiner for the Board of Parties and Paroles. Can the board members please state names to the record? Mike Full. Panel member Page. Panel member Target. This is a rescission hearing concerning Bakke Shaw, number 292343, today's April 25th, 2024. And this hearing is being conducted at the BOPP Central Office in Ottawa Corn Correctional Institution. This is a public hearing. Public access to this hearing is available via video live stream. Can you please state for me your name and inmate number, sir? Sean Bemke, 292-343. Thank you. You have counsel here today. Can you please identify yourself for the record? Attorney Nicole Gagnon. Thank you. This is a rescission hearing to determine whether you have violated the conditions of your release. I will review and make findings of facts to each charge against you. If I find you violate one or more conditions of your release, the board will consider whether or not your release should be rescinded. The decision made by the board today will be made final. This is an administrative hearing. The rules limiting the type of evidence admissible in a criminal trial do not apply in a parole rescission hearing. Disputed charges will be resolved by the preponderance of the evidence. The preponderance of the evidence means that evidence taken as a whole is more credible and convincing than evidence offered in opposition to it. If at any time during the hearing you have a question about the procedure, feel free to ask me about it. At this hearing, you have certain rights, which I will now review with you. Did you receive written notice of the hearing? Yes. Did you receive a packet of information, including the rescission notice and information supporting the charges against you? Yes. Okay, you have the right to be represented by an attorney at this hearing. You have attorney Gagnon here today representing you. Your right to submit relevant documentary evidence. Do you have any relevant documentary evidence to submit? No. No. At this hearing, you have a right to call and uh, voluntary witnesses and cross examine adverse witnesses. Do you have any witnesses to testify today? No. Are you prepared to proceed with the hearing at this time? Yes. Okay. So I will review each charge and form you of information underlying the charge. I will then ask you to admit or deny each charge and will give you an opportunity to respond to the charge. If you choose to make no reply to the charge, the hearing shall proceed and my, my decision will be made on the basis of the available information. At the conclusion of the, uh, the fact-finding portion of the hearing, I will inform you my findings. The hearing will then, uh, will then be turned over to the board to consider your suitability for re-release. So the testimony in today's hearing will be taken under oath. So, sir, I'm just going to swear you in under oath today if you choose to speak. Can you please raise your right hand for me? You solemnly swear, signed, sincerely affirm, as the case may be, the evidence you shall give concerning this case will be the truth, the whole truth, then the truth to help you go out upon penalty of perjury. Yes. So, um, I'm going to read the charges. So, charge one under new criminal conviction. On 10 10 23, Ms. Drumke was released and community released to the Stein Halfway House. On 10 11 23, Ms. Drumke left the halfway house in the past and failed to return to the program. His whereabouts remained unknown until he was returned to the Harper Correctional Center on 1 624. On 4 9 24, Ms. Drumke was found guilty of escape first and was sentenced to one year jail. Execution suspended with one year conditional discharge. In charge two, was escape from community release. On 10 10 23, Ms. Remke was released onto community release to Stein Halfway House. On 10 11 23, Ms. Remke left the halfway house in a pass and failed to return to the program. His whereabouts remained unknown until he was returned to the Harvard Correctional Center on 1 6 24. So, sir, would you, um, how would you admit to charge one? 
Yes. Do you admit the charge to? I did the same charge. Well, yeah, it's escape from community release. You accept responsibility on it. Yes. <clears throat> Would you like to offer an explanation at this time, um, either Attorney Gagnon or Mr. Rafi? Um, basically, I went out for my um, my hearing or my um, appointment to Methadone. I ran into an old friend. They uh, had some drugs and I went and got high. I mean, no excuse for it. I just I'm an addict. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to announce my findings. So on the charge one condition to criminal conviction, um, I make a finding based on admission of guilt and the conviction as well as evidence provided. On charge two, escape from community release, I make a finding based on admission of guilt as well as evidence and testimony provided, which I find more credible than the testimony offered in opposition. Um, so that includes the fact finding portion of the hearing. Um, should Mr. Bemke be re-paroled, what is his plan? Um, is, is there a plan for housing or employment opportunities um, that you'd like to express at this time? Uh, me, um, I'd like to, uh, if I can do a drug program, you know, I can be paroled to an inpatient drug program. We don't parole to inpatient programs. Um, it should be clean while you're in the facility. So you would be able to participate in drug programming, but we don't parole to inpatient drug programs. Um, it is the, if there's an incident on the outside, they will work with you to place your drug. You would continue with outpatient treatment um, upon your release. Do you have any plans for employment or housing? Um, yeah, I have. Um... I get a job. My buddy's got a moving company, or um, Trader Joe's will hire me back. In the housing, I can live with my mom, my mother's house. So you you like to sponsor to your mother's house? Yes. You got like GPS or something? What's your mother's name? Lorraine Bemke. What's, where does she live? In Enfield. What's the address? Uh, five seven. Is it a house? Yes. And what's her phone number? Uh, it's eight six zero. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, it's it's the old one. No, it's nine five nine eight nine. Um, so, Mr. Bemke, your parole eligibility date is 4-12 of 2024, and your end of sentence date currently is 10-12 of 2025. So, I do want to put that on the record, and I'm going to now turn the hearing over to the panel, Chair. Thank you, uh, Parole Officer Reisinger. Um, any questions from the panel? Um, Mr. Be thank you, sir, Chair. Uh, Mr. Benke, did, did, um, are you doing any programming while you're in the facility? I am, yes. I'm currently in Tier 4 and okay. I'm methadone. And I'm methadone. Okay. And how long have you been in Tier 4? Uh, I, I just started like the, about two weeks now. And um, how about your compliance there in the facility? Have you been compliant there? Yes. So no disciplinary infraction since your return. Um, when I first came in, I I didn't go to court. I just go detox and gave me a ticket for that. That was it, though. And what were you doing in the community when you were out there for three months? Um, I was using. And were you working? <laughs> um, I was. I was um. A grocery store helping old ladies carry their groceries to their car. And they will give you money? Yes. And so when you when you were on your way to the math clinic and you met your friend, where did you get the money from to get drugs? Or did he have the drugs already? Um, I had had money from when I left jail. I got some money to help. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Darden. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. Good morning, sir. How are you? Morning, all right. So you look familiar from a prior hearing. Um, it looks to me that um, your issue with substances has been a major issue, right? Whether it was Burke's heroin or fentanyl, right? And um, even when you got that pass and, and failed to return, what was going on um, that you didn't come back to the to to, um, to the halfway house? Well, I was gonna go back, but uh, I know it sounds like an excuse, but this is the truth. My my, my I was gonna go back. I, mean, I got high. I was still gonna go back. My bus pass it wasn't standing on the bus, so I figured I'm, I'm gonna be late. Plus a dirty hearing, you know, I'm going to be in trouble anyways. I know it's not a good excuse, that's just the way I, I, I rationalize it to make it make sense, you know what I mean? So what do you think that you need to be successful so you're not back before us in the future? I mean, where do you think that you might need help or programs or whatever that you might need that will be helpful to you to be successful. You said I'm a drug, uh, a drug program, I think. Okay. Have, have you looked into NAAA CCAR at all? Um, yeah, I was supposed to uh, get that set up while I'm here, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, you feel that your mom's a good resource for you to uh, <laughs> sponsor to? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for having a conversation with me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, just uh, I wanted to check in on the substance use stuff, and I appreciate the, the uh, questions from my fellow board members. Um, you're right now in the premier uh, tier program, substance use program for DOC. Yes. Um, and obviously you have a lot of work to do, right? Yes. Um, you know, and you come out here and, you know, uh, dependent upon your score, you either go to uh, they send you off to an inpatient or they send you to uh, IOP, right? Yeah. And um, that may last, you know, if it's inpatient, what, 20, 30 days maybe, mm. right? Yeah. And if it's an IOP, it's we're in the community and going to treatment during the day and then, you know, what are we doing for the rest, you know, the rest of the time kind of thing? Um, I applaud you that you're uh, dealing with MAT right now. Yes. Uh, that you're not dead. Um, that's a huge thing, right? Yeah. Um, especially coming out um, for the short amount of time that you're out and to use again. Um, you know how many guys we buried doing that, right? Yes. So I know it's like it's not going to happen to me. That's the mindset you get to. But the bottom line is that it's reality, right? Um, and that program that you're in um, is a really good program. Yes. Um, so as uh, fellow board member said, you know, you have the opportunity there uh, to deal with CCAR, yeah. to set something up so that on the way out the door, you aren't meeting the drug dealer, you're meeting a recovery coach. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's big and it's important. Yes. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you, um, you know, that's what you want to do. Uh, because for you to survive and for you to, you know, 
not make your mother crazy. You know, it's about not using and it's about doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, I don't have any further questions. Um, so we're dealing with a, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, attorney, do you have any anything that you would uh, like to say in this in this case? Yes, um, I did speak with an officer, Mandela, um, regarding Mr. Bemke, who stated that um, he would recommend that Mr. Bemke be on a GPS monitoring because Mr. Bemke helped him um, facilitate the arrests of several individuals. Um, and also, I'd just like to state that um, Mr. Bemke has a history of minor nonviolent crimes, mostly in furtherance of sustaining his drug habits or homelessness. He has limited, almost no DRs and um, is has been cooperative. Um, so um, I would just um, plead to the board that Mr. Bemke be released on uh, GPS monitoring so that he can um, continue his um, um, drug rehabilitation because that seems to be the the main problem with Mr. Bemke is yeah. uh, the, the the substance abuse. Okay. Um, are we any further questions? No. Okay. So uh, at this point, we need to uh, get to a place where we're um, going to look at sanctions and re release date. Um, so having been uh, uh, a finding been made uh, on both of the charges, right? Um, you know, the thing that it, things are in place for release in terms of sponsor to his mother's house, opportunities for employment. Um, he wants to do drug, he wants to do a drug program. He's in um, one of the best drug programs could be in, right? Um, he's only two weeks into it and it's a six month program. Um, I would be uh, comfortable. Uh, his EOS is 10, 12, 25. Um, I would be, I would be uh, uh, in a place where I could uh, support a um, revoke and re-parole uh, contingent upon his completion of that tier four program. Which is um, I mean the date uh, the date would be today and the con uh, the contingency would have him finishing that tier four program or he's not released. Right. Yeah. Which puts him at least until October. Which would give him a year on supervision. Prior to prior to his end of sentence, I think incarceration sentence. Thoughts so, from board members? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so upon completion of the program, and also the recommendation from the attorney as far as GPS monitoring goes, um, I'm okay with that. I think that will hopefully set him up for success, but. Uh, you know, there's no guarantee, but. In the fourth phase of that program, in the fourth phase of that tier four program, they will ready him. Right. For, uh, you know, going back into the community. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, so Chair, I, I would vote in the minority for Mr. Um, You know, uh, he, I, I'm not sure that he would have been a candidate that I would have supported discretion or parole for prior to his receiving a new conviction um, for escaping. He is nine, he's failed nine times out in the community. I understand fully that he's battling addiction. 
Um, and I think that the clean time in that facility would be beneficial for him because although these may be minor crimes, as the attorney said, they impact the community greatly. So um, for me, it's a it's a deny. Uh, I would resend his uh, vote to parole date, um, and I would not set any release date. So that's my position. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, upon completion and with the additional of the GPS monitor. Well, we don't have GPS monitor. Well, yeah, we can't. They'll do that. All the community. I mean, we can't. We can't. But I mean, you could say on the record that you would talk about it. it. Yeah. 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 But I just can't process it. Did you yeah. talk to the parole officer on that, uh, attorney? Is that who you spoke with? The officer, yeah. See, no, so, it was yeah. Officer Mandela who said he spoke to the parole officer. Okay, so that's something that GPS GPS monitoring is a decision from the field. And certainly uh, on a re-release like this uh, with an escape conviction, that's where they would go, you know. Um, this board uh, does not set that as a stipulation. However, the field would uh, put something like that in place, especially on an escape conviction, I believe. Okay. Um, so, um, in regard to regard to inmate Stephen Bamke two nine two three four three, I move to uh, rescind his parole. Uh, with a re-parole date of 4-25-24, contingent upon completion of the Tier 4 program that he is currently in. Uh, is there a second? Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. Um, on a vote of two to one, Mr. Bemke, you've been, um, your parole's been rescinded uh, with a re-parole date of today. However, it is. Um, oh, and we'll set the stipulation in just a second as well. I think it's a new vote to pull the. Yes, it's new. It's a new vote. Where, where is the? I'm sorry. Where the new parole? You're giving the new parole date. Which is going to parole date? Okay. Instead of a recall date. Recall. You're. A vote is the parole date. Yep. With the new voted parole date of 425-24, contingent upon completion of the tier four program. And what that means is that if you don't complete that program, you're not going to be released. Um, you know, there's nothing better that you can do than to continue to do what you're doing. Um, and hang out for one second, please. Uh, do you have recommendations on um, on? Uh, I like to be adding halfway health placement in case due to his um, failures in the community and his escape um, conviction. Having halfway health placement on there, and that depending on when he's done with the program and okay. things like that, um, we don't know exactly what date he's going to go. Recommend just having the half of the on there in case you can't go with the five Do you have any of the original conditions I thought that I just saw? Halfway health was uh, in mental health evaluation. Uh, was also on the previous. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I have written right on. I would carry over both those. Okay. Um, okay. So further, uh, the panel would set the following uh, parole stipulations halfway house placement if necessary. Mental health evaluation and treatment is deemed necessary. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. And the hearing, uh, the stipulations for your parole have been set. All right. One second. Do you have any so, questions, sir? Do you understand? Yeah. 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 I understand. Mr. Bamke, finish that there for. It'll help. help you. And yeah. set up. Set up support with CCAR with recovery coach on your way out. All right. It's, it's really key to your success. Okay. And just be aware if you receive any DRs and you're removed, you will not be paroled. 
All right. Okay. So so make sure you make that a priority to stay out of trouble and to do what you're supposed to do in that in the group. Okay. I will. All right. So you're all set, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you counsel. For Mr. Bachelor, number two nine two three four three. Thank you, Attorney Gagnon. Have a good day. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you to the board. Some of this stuff you just can't make up. I mean, basically what happened is that they they just they revoked his parole, but then immediately gave him parole on the same day. So at the time of this recording, 425-2024, um, is the real, I don't know when I'm going to publish this, but they rescinded him and then paroled him on the same day. Like, is that even a thing? Um, now, on condition that he finishes this program. So I guess if you want to say in comparison to Louisiana, they would do in lieu of revocation, we're going to send you to Steve Hoyle. It's like about a nine month program. You'll finish it and then you can come up and then you can get paroled if you if you finish that. I, I, without the context of exactly how long this fourth tier program is, is it like the same thing? I mean, I, I, I it, it's it, but the, the whole thing seems a bit like again a joke. Richard sent this hearing to me with the uh, in the email with the um, emoji, the classic uh, meme of of Cartman with his pants down and it says "respect my authority," and it's like something that people. <laughs> I mean, at least one of the board members had common sense in this one, it seemed. Remember, and, you know, Richard shared the link with the, He was just paroled. Like they said, he was just paroled. And it's four months later that he picks up a new felony for escape. His excuses, I mean, maybe you can give him some credit for it where he was just honest. Um, he's like, I don't know. I met a buddy and got high. And the thing is, is that, this is now his 10th time that he's been revoked. You know, it, it's like th that classic saying, do the same thing over and over and expect different results. What? This isn't benefiting anyone. It's clearly not working for him. This is his 10th revocation. It's not working for the community as one of the board members graciously graciously um, uh, stated and it's it, it's just it, it's like what do you think what do you guys really think that he's going to finish this program it was Paige thank you Richard put in the notes I, I knew Richard would do that a page is the only one that 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 said I'm not going to go for this insanity and she said she didn't even think she would have paroled him back then and i mean it looked like the guy was tweaking during his hearing i'm you know it's just my opinion but the guy looked like he was tweaking out at his parole hearing come on guys uh like really Really, you think just finishing another phase of a program is the right move for this guy? I don't know what the right move is. Maybe it's actually a, a, a longer sentence where he can find like a, a, some type of, you know, I, I'm not claiming to know. But let's go through his record that Richard provided. I mean, it, it's just, and it's not all tiny little things. Let's see, here's one of them. Now, this is when he was a teenager. I don't know how many years ago. Well, actually, no, he was 20, uh, well, I guess 17 at the time, but it looks like they stole a truck and drove it into, uh, and it basically wrecked it. And then they stole another vehicle to run away from the cops. You know, there's a lot of different little weird things, larceny, burglary, burglary. But let's see if we go to his master record here. And you can see by looking at his master record, it's these little, like, they give a little slap on the wrist. So it, it it's only going back 10 years in his master record, but it, it could be he has 20 years of, of arrest, but they only go back 10 years. So he has violating protective order. That's a serious 
and always in my opinion that's not um but they gave him just a suspended sentence looks like he had another violation of protection order then he has uh the 2009 53a failure to appear but they gave him an unconditional sentence an unconditional discharge i'm not quite sure what that means and he has a larceny six sentence against an unconditional discharge arrested 327 2022 possession of substance abuse sentence to 11 months in jail so finally they gave him 11 months in jail um it's actually it's a little hard for me to he, he, there's so many different sentencing dates and then the most recent one is april 9 2024 which is only just a couple weeks ago which was his escape sentenced to one year in jail but it was suspended <laughs> and then he gets revoked they rescind him <laughs> So even this new charge, they gave him a year in jail, but suspended it. So it's officially, according to the record, he has a new charge called escape. They sentence him, but give him zero time. Then the parole board has a chance to revoke him. They do revoke him, but parole him immediately. And now he just needs to finish this program. Guys, do you really think that he's just going to get out and turn his life around? I mean, it just takes a little bit of common sense and data to see that, no, he won't. Ten times he's failed. Um, it's not doing him any favors. You're not helping him. It's like It's like the parent who gives the child everything they want. That doesn't make you a good parent on the contrary that's my two cents it's weird watching this stuff the parole board it, it, there's just no way I, I think around it but the parole board seems just to be kind of what's the word inept anyways thank you richard for the info and with that i'll let you go